This time on Broad and High. We'll celebrate the holiday season with a visit to the Jubilee Museum. Our collection is the largest diversified. If you'd find it in a church, you'll likely find it here. Explore the biblical story of the three wise men told through contemporary sacred art. And lots of nativity sets. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Manicky, and tonight we're bringing you a festive selection of stories to help celebrate the holiday season. First up, the Jubilee Museum in Franklinton. It holds the largest collection of Catholic and liturgical artwork in the United States. It's got so much more than just altars, investments, and stained glass windows, and this feature just barely brushes the surface. Take a look. The museum is located in the old Holy Family High School and Grade School buildings on South Grub Street, right along 315. It's a very lively place with about 22 rooms filled with all manner of things from Catholic history, as well as some Jewish items and Protestant things. It started as a small project in 1998. Uh, every parish was doing something for the Jubilee year. The year 2000 was the millennium and the second uh, millennium since the birth of Christ. So that was a big deal in the church. And I'd been a little bit of a collector, so I thought, well, let's just do a little retro look backwards and look at our history in the diocese. And it's grown to something far larger than I ever imagined. We have been told by Cardinal Marcasano, God rest his soul, he died uh, about a year ago, but he said we were the largest in the United States with a diversified collection. Now if you go to Notre Dame University, they have the largest collection of bishops' items. The University of Dayton has the largest collection of nativity scenes in the country. This year they've loaned us two of them. But our collection is the largest diversified, so if you'd find it in a church, you'll likely find it here. The museum, it offers a very diverse collection of art, from oil paintings to Bibles going back, you know, 14, 15, 1600s, to altars. You know, one of the largest altar companies in the United States was in Cincinnati, Ohio. It was just German immigrants that came over and they knew how to carve. So, um, so we show those altars off, and there's a piece behind me here that you'll see later. Um, it was carved here in um, Columbus, right on Spring Street, and on the back it says the guy's name is from Germany, and um, it was from a church in Akron that we recently saved. We have um, the Franz Meyer stained glass windows here from St. Vincent's Orphanage, which were about as good as it gets. They were just the Steinway of stained glass windows. Some rooms, there's things that are funny. There's other things that bring a tear to your eye. You're gonna get a, a real mix. There are, there's a traditional Catholic school classroom set up, and in other rooms you'll find, for instance, a Bible we have that's the first Bible ever printed by a woman, printed in 1558 in Paris. Our oldest book is a 1501. It's an altar missal with the prayers of the Latin Mass in it. But that book was on the altar in use when Christopher Columbus was still walking around and Michelangelo was still painting. We have uh, about 40 works by Sadeo Watanabe, an Asian artist who has created many beautiful works that depict Old and New Testament scenes. The Vatican actually owns uh, 10 of his pieces and they're hanging right outside the Sistine Chapel. So. Right now, our nativity display, we have um, a scavenger hunt, and everybody can go through and count the nativities in each room. There are over 200 nativity scenes, and um, the most unusual this year is on loan to us from Dayton. It's a cardboard nativity set 
And when you hear cardboard, you're going to immediately have an image in your mind that's pretty awful. But when you see this thing, you look at it in almost disbelief that that's made out of cardboard. That's the largest and the most interesting one that everybody wants to see is the walnut. We have a little walnut that has a baby Jesus on one side and three kings in the other. So we have a lot of them to look at. So here at the museum, we have three pipe organs um, on permanent display. And uh, downstairs here on the first floor, we have a little um, funeral parlor organ. Um, obviously in the 1920s, if you wanted an organ, it had to be a pipe organ. So um, this organ was from a funeral parlor, Wisconsin, and um, just a little guy, three ranks. But it, it's nice because people can actually see inside the pipes and how it functions. We have the case removed from them so you can see the inner workings. The kids watch them start up and the bellows rise. And you turn on the tremolo and the bellows will shake like that. Then, you know, you play it and you're pointing to the different pipes that are making sounds. They're kind of intrigued by it. Celebrate the Advent season at the Jubilee Museum and see how many nativity sets you can find. There are more than 200 of them on display, including one made entirely out of cardboard. They'll be on view through January 6th. Visit jubileemuseum.org to learn more. The three wise men might have traversed afar, but we're just venturing into Delaware for this next story. At St. Peter's Episcopal Church, there is an exhibit that features a selection of artwork that depicts a recognizable moment in the Christmas Nativity story, as seen through the eyes of contemporary artists. So when I permanently sort of settled in Delaware six or seven years ago, I started to come to this church, St. Peter's Episcopal Church. And uh, I spoke with the rector and I said, you know, I've got all this art. What would you think if I were to show some of it here? Maybe if you've seen like a room here, I could put it up. He said, put it up here in the sanctuary. These are pieces, you can look at them and you'll say, okay, this is the story of the three wise men. Artists have been doing this for years. What do these contemporary artists have to say about that story? Well, there are 23 different artists and they come from 13 different countries. One of the prints which I included is a uh, wood engraving by a German-American artist whose name is Fritz Eichenberg. He's known for his uh, illustrations of Dostoevsky. And the one I have is titled The Year of the Child. And if you look at it, the date is, is 1979. And when you study the print, you'll see that Mary is actually a Vietnamese refugee and she's holding in her arms an emaciated Christ child. And the gifts that the three wise men are bringing in this particular print are not gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but a bowl of rice, a pitcher of milk, and an apple. The Watanabe piece, he's one of my favorite artists. Uh, Watanabe was, was trained as a fabric designer and a color of kimonos and he was converted to Christianity and this profoundly influenced his sense of the world and the type of art that he wanted to make. So he felt this call to make art that was Japanese in form but would be Christian in content. The wise men always interested him because they came from the East. Another work that I've included is from an Australian Aboriginal artist. Her name's Linda Siddick Napaljari. So she was raised as a Christian and, and had a, a Christian schooling. And in her art, she reflects this dual vision of a Christian worldview combined with an Aboriginal worldview. So in this particular picture of the three wise men, they're depicted as almost Aboriginal spiritual men. The coloring of the painting, it's, it's acrylic on linen, but the color very much matches ochre, earth paintings that would be typical. You have the Christ child lying in a wooden bowl. It's called a kulaman. And this is sort of if you're an Aboriginal people and you're always on the move and you have no de really defined sense of territory as we do, uh, it's very convenient to have this 
bowl that you can use for storing food or serving it or keeping the baby. There are a lot of church galleries that are opening across the country. I think we're a bit unusual here in that we actually put the art up where we worship, but it adds an extra dimension to it. You look at this and, and it's intuitive art. I think a lot of contemporary art is counterintuitive. We look at it and we don't understand it. This is very intuitive art. You look at it and you'll grasp what it's about. Naturally, a big part of the holiday season is the decorating. Some local floral designers helped me learn how to make my own festive arrangement using many items you can find in your own backyard. So tonight we're doing a festive holiday class. So it is a wreath decorating. The wreaths are, are pre-made already and they're just going to embellish them with ornaments and things. And then they're also going to make a floral foam arrangement. And floral foam arrangements are really great because they last a lot longer than a vase arrangement. They're a little bit less maintenance as well. So you don't have to keep changing the vase or the water out. You know, it's just kind of one, one and done and then they'll last for several weeks for the holidays, which is always nice for entertaining. So, do we start yes. with the greens? Yes. So, so what are all these? They all look different. This guy is called Lemon Leaf or Salau. Then the other ones are more Christmas greens. So okay. this is pine, and then this is cedar. Um, but something like this, you can just pull it right off your tree. So the first step in um, working on an arrangement is called greening a vase. Okay, so are you deliberately sort of starting on the outside the perimeter? Am. Okay. I kind of like starting here, and then I'll kind of work my way in. Okay. And we can always go back in and fill in spots if they look okay. bare. We've greened the vase. Yes, we've okay. greened the vase. Success. <laughs> um, I'm a huge fan of metallics, so what I did is I took the lemon leaf and I actually tinted it with um, its floral spray paint, essentially. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And it still has that natural feel, like this doesn't mm -hmm. feel like a plastic plant. Which yeah, is nice. exactly. But clearly it's been jazzed up a little. <laughs> Just a little. Yeah. A little bedazzle for it. Then I'm going to go in with some roses. Fun. So I have a few different varieties here. So the flowers will be the first things to kind of go once the floral foam starts to dry, but you can just pluck those out and still have a nice greenery piece. It really can last for a month, and that's why we really love to work with greeneries as a base. They come grown with something called guard petals. It helps Ooh. protect them when they're being shipped. Okay. So there's a few on the outside that are green or discolored. And so with that, you can just pluck those right off. Also fun, at floral shops, you um, can throw everything on the floor. Oh, yes. well, then. <laughs> and you just sweep up later. So keep your tabletop clean. Okay. <laughs> I think most people are frustrated with roses because they don't understand a lot of the care that goes into them. So they'll buy them from the market and come home and then they'll die a few days later. And it, a lot of times it's because they weren't put in water soon enough. Roses are one of the only flowers that you um, really need to be careful about cutting it on an angle. Um, it prevents it from sitting directly in the bottom and being cut off from its water source. That only applies to roses? Pretty much. Oh, well, I made it I roses. know, they are, they are, but for a reason, they're pretty. This is called Alstroemeria, um, and you can find this guy quite a bit at the grocery store. They're pretty tight and closed up right now, but as you let it sit out in your house, they'll, they'll keep blooming. Yeah. Okay. Then I also have some spray roses. A spray rose is a miniature version of a standard rose and they also have multiple blooms on a stem. So there'll be three to five rose blooms on a mini one versus the standard. You know, I kind of like them all branchy. Yeah. It'll help fill it in nicely. These are called hypericum berries. Okay. With these though, you do want to be careful with pets or that kind of thing. Oh. Um, they're actually toxic to eat. Well, so, fun. yep, keep that in mind wherever you're placing it. Another thing that you can do, um, and very easy to you know gather from your own yard, mm -hmm. I just had pine cones. Perfect. Cool. And then all you do is just take a long, thin wire mm -hmm. and just kind of work it in there. Okay. And then just twist it and just tuck it in the foam. Okay. And then you can kind of just manipulate it and nestle it between flowers and it kind of supports itself. Okay. 
then the other thing that I have that's a fun addition um, and everyone loves because it smells so good mm -hmm. are taking oranges or clementines. I use clementines because they're a little yeah. smaller and just putting cloves in them. If you've never done the cloves mm -hmm. and the clementines before, it's just really simple to buy whole cloves. Whole cloves. It's important. And you just pierce them in. You don't yeah. have to like prick it first or anything? No, like not at all. So they okay. have kind of um, they have kind of a pointed end. So whatever design that you want to make, you can just kind of just yeah, just push okay. it right and in, they and smell then so good. Mm -hmm. So this is called a hyacinth pick, but you could get something like this at like a dowel rod okay. or you Skinny know anything. Rod, yeah. Yep, exactly. Even like shish kebab skewers or something whatever like that. Whatever, buy. whatever works. So, and it gives it a stem to stick wow, in there. That is yeah. amazing. There you go. It's so pretty. Yeah. I can't believe we made that. I know. It didn't take very long either. That's amazing. Thank you for showing me how yeah, to do it. Exactly. I feel like I could go home and do this. Yes, you I can't. I'd have to clean up my own floor, which would be a bummer. <laughs> but. This is great. Thank yep. you so much. Thank you. The Flower Man has locations in Dayton and Columbus, but you can find them in one place on Facebook, where you can see endless samples of their floral creations. The artist in this next segment has spent the past few years carving sculptures for her expansive nativity scene, which is on display every year at St. Francis of Assisi Church in Victorian Village. We stopped by to see this non-traditional exhibit made entirely out of gourds. We're at St. Francis of Assisi in uh, Victorian Village. This is the church hall, which is underneath the, the, the main church. Well, I always liked gourds, and some years ago I saw um, a nativity in a, um, a fair trade uh, store here in Columbus, and it was a two-piece nativity made out of gourds, wood burn, from Peru. And I thought, I like gourds, I can do that. So I started on just the mama and papa, and then I found a gourd that looked like a giraffe to me. And I figured, okay, if there's going to be a giraffe, there has to be other African animals. So it just grew out of that. I've got about 65 animals. I have a couple of favorite pieces. I like the bat. I like the porcupine. Uh, I like the cheetah. I like the rat. <laughs> they were the the second two that I made after the draft, the rat. They're all dried gourds, um, so they're not gonna rot, they're not gonna <laughs> mold or anything else. The, they're all wood burned. The Indian King's camel took me a week to do, just the week, because he was a two humper and he has lots of hair growing out of him and then, you know, of course, he's gotta have saddle and all that kind of stuff. And I look for specific shapes sometimes. Sometimes I go and something calls to me and says, I know that's a sheep or I know that's an alligator or whatever. And sometimes I just go looking for parts like uh, gourd stems or long neck gourds that I can use the, the long neck as legs on something. The loofahs are, make great sheep. Uh, gourd seeds make uh, ears and um, tongues sometimes. Gourd stems are legs and, and tails. A lot of the things that the kings bring are natural things, things that I've found outside or I've found some strange pod from East Africa at the gourd show. It's interesting that when you open up a gourd, you're never gonna, you never know what you're gonna find inside. Sometimes the inside is, is a luminous color that looks almost silvery, and so you can use that. I got an angel that has wings and a halo out of that, and I did nothing to the inside of the gourd. That's the way it came. You never know what you're gonna find out, and that's the exciting part, that every time that you open up a gourd, it's a brand new experience. Two years ago, I added a queen. Instead of the three kings, I added a queen. Um, an Egyptian queen. The angels all play traditional African instruments. 
The African king has traditional um, kente cloth for the mat that he puts his things on, and he wears a traditional kente cloth um, fabric. The same with the Asian king and the Indian king. The fabrics that they wear and the mats that they have their um, gifts on are traditional to that era or that culture. Every culture who knows this story is going to put it in context for them that's meaningful for them, whether it's an Alaskan um, nativity or whether it's a Chinese nativity, they're all going to be in. So this is an African nativity to me. Our final segment tonight is one we originally brought you in 2013. It features the expansive model train display that for the past few years has been set up in the lobby of the main library downtown. This year it's back in its original location at the Huntington Bank building. But the train will be back up and running in the newly renovated library in time for the holidays next year. So the Huntington Holiday Train was originally built in 1992 uh, by Applied Imagination and they are based out of Alexandria, Kentucky. Uh, and it was originally commissioned for the uh, Huntington Bank uh, and between 1992 and 2008 it was displayed in the lobby of their historic building uh, on High and Broad Streets. So in 2009 they graciously loaned uh, the display to the, to the library and this is the fifth year it will be on display here at, uh, at Main Library. Um, before we ever got here in Columbus, we spent months making the buildings that you see years ago, and we've added to them as time have, has gone on. So yesterday morning, we all got together with trucks and trailers and our storage unit, loaded everything up, tied everything down, looked like the worst case of the Beverly Hillbillies going down the road you ever saw, and it all comes unloaded here before the library ever closes. There will be some of us in the room with the mashed up, mangled up Christmas trees, unhooking, undoing, straightening up, making them pretty again, while the construction crew is out here laying in platforms, deciding where to put train track, just the skeleton kind of things. Then they, the first thing that goes in place is this huge castle, um, heavier than all get out, but it kind of defines where everything else goes around it. We've got a castle, we've got a waterfall, that needs to be in very quickly. Um, and, and then stuff just builds from around there. The day started today with beginning to do the pretty stuff, beginning to place where the buildings go and that gets set. And then we start bringing in the green trees around it to make it come to life. Applied imagination is a combination of Virtually everything I like to do. I graduated from Ohio State in 72 as a landscape architect who I had started college in, as a, intending to be an architect. I love building models. I love gardening. And most of all, I've loved toy trains ever since I was a little kid. The one thing I think that makes our work at Applied Imagination very unique is people normally think of a train display as on a tabletop. Well, we want to create something very three-dimensional so you look at it from any angle. There's depth and, you know, instead of you being the giant outside this miniature world, we'd love to draw you in. The display is, uh, it, it's about 600 square feet uh, and it includes about six trains running on about 280 feet of track uh, and the buildings are all actually modeled after uh, real structures in Bavaria in southern Germany. They're all actually built uh, from all natural plant materials such as pine cones, bark, seeds, acorns and so on. 
So it's really a magical display and we invite everyone to come out and see for themselves what makes it so wonderful. That's our show. To see all of today's stories, visit WOSU.org. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter where you can submit your own story ideas. Father Lutz is helping to close out the show today with some holiday melodies he played for us on the pipe organ at the Jubilee Museum. From all of us here at WOSU Public Media, have a safe and happy holiday season. We'll see you next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences.